Well, my name is John Johnson, and I'm a mathematician that likes archaeology. Let's put it this way. That's all. Thank you, Jerry. of archaeology, and especially the, the Shroud of Turin, which I studied for um, even before I was a biblical Christian, and it got me interested in Christianity. <coughs> Today, I'm here not to prove the genuineness of the Shroud, but to show you it's an interesting uh, relic, an interesting thing we can learn from, and also may uh, help illustrate uh, things about our, our history. Whether, and, and also, and we'll see this. Uh, first of all, I'm just reviewing what I'm going to talk about here. The, uh, the problem that we have in believing something, I don't believe in an archaeological relic, and I don't think you want to either. Uh, just like uh, Speaker uh, Collins was saying, we shouldn't believe this is the city of Sarah. It's, it's something, belief is not something that we want to do with archaeological relics. Uh, we are to believe in the reliability of the scriptures. It has some merit. Uh, there is some consequence to that. Or to believe in the efficacy of Christ's blood on the cross, that can, that's the words for Pesteo, we'll talk about that. We're not to reverence relics, but to give them serious consideration in what we can learn from them, like we did just from the city of, uh, uh, we think of Solomon. I don't know, we'll talk about forensics, the fact that sometimes in history we can call something a false, uh, it's false relics. Uh, sometimes we can say it's true and find out it really was false, and I'll talk about those things in the Vinland maps, and the diary of the that was considered to be true and that was false. So both directions, uh, how we can make some, some huge errors in, in uh, forensics, uh, that's forensics of relics, not forensics uh, in, in uh, uh, law, which is very similar. We'll talk about five questions about authenticity regarding the trial that we're in. Uh, first one we'll be talking about is probably, is this crucified man an image or a medieval faith? And of course, that would involve substantially about the 1988 Carbon 14 Day, uh, which is what uh, Teddy Hall, the famous debunker of the uh, Hill Dam Man, was uh, crowing about how he had been uh, now successfully uh, debunked in the Maturin Shroud. Uh, second question we'll date on if we, whether or not we can identify that, we'll also identify the question, even if we can do that, uh, was the first century date of uh, for the living. Regardless of what's on there, who is on there, what about the fabric itself or, uh, and the image on there? Could we date it in some sense to the first century? Third question we'll have, if we pass those two or at least consider them, is, uh, is there a provenance trail? Provenance is, is the history of ownership. Can we find a trail going back to Jerusalem? Fourth question we'll have, if we pass all those, those uh, questions and tests successfully, uh, is it the image of Jesus himself and how would we? Uh, uh, what test would we use for that? Of course, we'll be using biblical tests, the tests for that. And fifthly, uh, the most difficult question, which some people address first, if you're not suggesting that the, the uh, medieval faith, especially while well, the same is formed, was it formed by a real crucified man, which is some people have proposed um, in the 15th, 14th century, and just simply shaped it up, using a real crucified man or uh, our dead body. Could, it be, could that be done, and uh, how would it be done? So those image forms are probably the most difficult question, the one I can't even answer today, uh, but I can give you some proposals about uh, that possibility. And lastly, why does this whole question even matter? Why even deal with relics? Who cares? Uh, I think one of the strangest things I found in researching it, even this week, was to find out the Shroud of Turin is persona non grata on every seminary campus. If you look on the website of Dallas Theological Seminary, you can't find one single hit on it except the debunk. Uh, and treat it as, uh, as, as, as something, not debunk it, but treat it as something not to even be discussed and like that. So anyway, so what we'll do about today is go through these first things and first discuss what the word for pesteo in the Greek language it means to trustingly believe. And it's been mistranslated, I believe, in the King James and other Bibles, uh, as, uh, as just simply calling it belief, not because it's a wrong translation, it's because in English, and King James understood better than we do today, because the English language has changed. Today we believe we're going to have a cup of coffee. We think we're going to do something. It has nothing to do with the word pesteo in Greek. That is, to me, in Greek it means to trustingly believe. And that's the way that actually the NIV translated correctly is trust, if you want to make a single word. About uh, John 8, 24, Jesus said, unless you trustingly believe that I am a that's able a mine, which is a very unusual word, uh, that means I am, uh, and we add the English word he, then you shall die in your sins. So 
So the word there is correctly used, the one they uh, were we mean by late. It's useful and as well as made necessary to, Jesus says, to trustingly believe that I am basically the Redeemer. And this. So the caveat that is the, the thing to worry about is you trustingly believe only in Christ's redemptive act of God's word. That is, has some merit and, and, and an eternal merit, not relics. Um, in in uh, God's commandment in the Bible, Genesis and uh, Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments was, says, you shall not, you may read along with me, you shall not make for yourself an idol, a likeness what is in heaven above or earth beneath, and you shall not worship her, that is, I say, for reverence or serve them. Uh, my conclusion is from that, my training, my dad and from my church is, uh, we are horrid images and icons of God the Father of the Son. And uh, that is to be an iconoclast. Iconoclast actually originally was used as a destroyer of images. We're not to destroy it in other people's images, we're to destroy it in our own uh, churches and lives. We're not to use them as something to reverence. That's what my interpretation of the, uh, the Exodus uh, commandment is. Um, but Reverend uh, Messiah, Jews don't even show the face of Jesus. So we don't have an image of Jesus in our church, in our house. That, I think, is the proper way to look at it. If we're going to put an image of Jesus in the house, I would put up a black style, black uh, or a, a, a North American Indian. Then it'd be more. Then I would I would say, okay, you're showing that it's a re representative of everyone on this earth. Um, is, that's what he is to be a uh, Messiah for them. The symbols are reminded of God's power to heal. This is the strange thing I learned from this thing. I never thought of this much, but uh, Jesus said in John chapter three verse fourteen, as Moses lifted up the bronze, the servant in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever trustingly believes in him, into him actually, him may have eternal life. Um, but what was a bronze serpent? The bronze serpent, and Moses, in Numbers 21, verse 9, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it under standard. And it came about that if any servant bit any man, then when he looked upon the bronze servant, he lived. Well, we are today to look upon the Jesus' life on the cross as to look toward it for healing. But in Hezekiah's time, 2 Kings 18, 4, uh, the 13th king of Judah broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. What had happened? So seven by seven, 15, seven centuries later, um, they had become an object of worship. They had, uh, but in this time, period of time of Moses, in this art, nice artwork we had by Adrian one Nick Kinderblein, is uh, that it was to look toward it would be healing. Well, this is something we don't think of today, but it really made a difference in their lives. They had something that not only needed, but was efficacy, had efficacy uh, toward healing. So I think there will be some application here uh, that's independent from the uh, abhorring of the images. What is forensics? Forensics is the object of certifying relics. Well, this is a more general definition. Obviously, forensics can be that of crime and law to convict somebody of a crime. Who did it? How? When? Um, but not everything that in, in law is to determine who did it. After all, forensics, it says somebody's got a, a, a pain or an object. Is it real? That is still a legal definition because you need copy, copyrights, you need, uh, need permit, good ownership. In the case of this Yale uh, Vinland map we'll discover, it's because it's worth a lot of money. You need to be these bumps, something of great relic value. Um, the possession of history is the name of the providence. Providence is a is it the history that who owned it when? Uh, and you want to pick his method of creation. That you can debunk something if you can prove that a piece of ink on an ancient map was not available in the time that that map was supposedly created. So you either make uh, a relic genuine or debunk this fraud um, as the most recent creation. It makes a lot of difference for, uh, for money uh, if you want to put that or ownership. The Norse map at Yale University shows that I own. Uh, we think maybe Newfoundland in the right place, west of Greenland. So it has all that marks of what it should be. But uh, it was dated to the year 1450 by Yale scholars. And uh, so it was worth a very significant amount, very significant to our history. It has been later, later uh, has been corroborated by actual archaeology on, on Newfoundland. You say that it says probably it's correct. So, but at the time that uh, McCrone debunked it, in 1974, he found precipitated anatase, that is crystallized titanium dioxide, 
Um, but he made a mistake of neglecting 16 contaminants. Well, it turns out that titanium dioxide, when you do it here in our contemporary civilization, you don't have any contaminants. You have very good chemical uh, laboratories that can very easily eliminate contaminants. So mark of contaminants is ancient, it's not modern paints. Uh, so to go make a long story short, it's recertified after he died, and I can, he wrote a book on it, you know, throwing out I, I, the months of inland map uh, papers, but it was recertified it was wrong in 1995. More detailed spectral and cyclotron analysis of further on 21 impurities by Yale University, uh, uh, by Yip and Set Scholars at the University of California, and Davis independently certified that Macron was definitely wrong. Uh, why is I bring this up? Well, Macron will come up and feature prominently in debunking the trap. Um, also, on the other side, what about the other direction? Forensic errors in confirming relics falsely. Uh, the Hitler diaries were confirmed as authentic by handwriting experts, including Max Pride. Uh, remember the name, it will come up a little later because they'll use arguments the other direction, because Max Pry will be a proponent of this crowd based on Holland dating. Turn uh, Magazine paid 9 million marks to the, uh, to the, uh, for the diaries. Uh, the problem, and again, the person they paid it to was an intermediary, it wasn't the hoaxer because he would have been uh, found um, uh, that way, but so it's a conspiracy. But the problem was most of the real examples that were presented to Max Fry and the other experts were by the same torture. But the most outrageous part about the whole Max, the, the uh, Hitler diaries, there was such a huge amount, remember that amount, 1983, uh, is there were 60 volumes. I mean, if you're going to make, make a fraud, make it a big one. You know? uh, <laughs> But he had so much forgery around there that the examples that they were putting to vary against were by the forger. So, but by the time this all got sorted out and uh, debunked, it was a long time, several years, and uh, based on paper and the various other characteristics. But, but the most interesting thing about it, this forger, Conrad Kajal, was so clever, he wound up being convicted by a, only 42 months for fraud and wound up keeping all the money. <laughs> I thought that was pretty nice, pretty clever. I guess they weren't able to prove enough uh, fraud, you know, the fraud is nobody had been lost in money, they voluntarily give them the money. But, uh, but the major thing I'm doing is here today, we will never hear on any other presentation of the crowd, I will give an equal handed degree point on both sides. I'm not an iconoclast, I'm not a shroudy, I'm not a proponent of the shroud, I'm going to try to give an even handed uh, exit of uh, both sides of the issue. And the surprising thing was made mention to you, there's more hostility against the shroud among Bible-believing academics than there are among atheists, which is surprising. Most people think it's the other way around. Uh, the Bible skeptics, critics uh, come from the four different viewpoints uh, in this history. The first one is the atheist side, the skeptical inquirer, and the other viewpoints is Scott. So they're, they're prominent ones written in the book of Joe Nichol. Uh, that thinks it's an artist's forgery, thinks he can do it by mass relief, and we'll discuss that some. Uh, but the most uh, significant, I think, is Josh McDowell, is a skeptical based on the mummy wrap theory. I have a guy from my, um, my group, at, at Bible group, that uh, thinks the same thing, is that you can't uh, think it's possible again. We got, we got a trump card. The, the, the Bible says it was a wrap like a mummy. We'll discuss that. I think it's a very important issue. Uh, the third issue, and you'll find in the Skeptic magazines and otherwise, well, the church prelates, they've also, they've already identified them. The first one around said Bishop Pierre de Arcees in 1389 when uh, the uh, lady pulled out the shroud out of her closet, and his widow, and started to show it, said, oh, I know it's not a, not a shroud. He provided this letter to the, the, uh, the uh, Clement, the, uh, the uh, we call the anti-pope in, uh, in France, and uh, he said that, the, that it was Cunningly painted, the truth be tested by the artist. Well, that was kind of strange. Most people, when they quote this, they don't realize that uh, Bishop the Pierre de Arce never even went to Liberty, uh, to, to the area uh, uh, near to uh, see the shroud. So he didn't even have a, his own personal viewpoint. So how did he get under this attitude? Well, he may have he may, uh, may have talked to somebody, uh, somebody that had copied the shroud. We don't really know, but it's certainly a point of evidence. We can't neglect it, it's, it is uh, part of the, the trail. Uh, finally, the most compelling uh, argument by skeptics is that Walter McGrone, this expert on uh, dating uh, elements like the Vinland map and elsewhere, uh, identified against, uh, 
type uh, ferrous uh, dioxide, uh, iron oxide uh, on the shroud and artist pigments. And he was very different. And he wrote a book about it, he wrote it in his journal. What they failed to point out was that the journal he published in, published in was not refereed, it was his own journal of uh, microscopy. And so it was not fairly judged. And when I asked people, scientists from the shroud viewpoint, um, and most of them, like I say, not Bible believers, is that uh, he wouldn't answer them. He wouldn't come to the conferences. He came to one, I think. Uh, but he didn't, uh, he didn't want to address the issues. He just simply had his viewpoint that this is painted by a, by a person, and uh, that's that. He, to his dying day. Uh, finally, the most important part is the carbon-14 dating of 1988. Uh, three labs dated to 1260 to 1390. Uh, Teddy Hall quoted on that saying, anybody believing the shroud is like a flat earther at this point. So it's definitely, he's got it done. Unfortunately, he didn't mention the fact that all carbon-14 dating in anthropology, and I'm familiar with that, is done in context. When you're doing a, a, a dating of carbon-14, you ask, what are the other circumstances related to it? If it doesn't agree with it, you've got to be suspicious of that in your dating, because uh, it does come out wrong sometimes. And so you do ask that question. Well, he was careful to divorce himself from any of that. He wanted to make it totally independent dating, and so he, he eliminated the crowd, uh, crowd from even addressing the method of doing it. Even though they, the crowd, they call it the Sturk crowd, was, was all scientists, and most of them uh, non-religious scientists, like agnostic Jews, agnostics. Um, so, uh, and uh, some, they decided that they weren't going to be involved in it. We're going to work, work in and do it independently. So let's discuss that when we get to it. Uh, first question is, um, we're going to discuss today, does the image have the blood of a crucified man or a medieval faith? Uh, by the way, if you have a question on any of the points that are issued here today that's related to the Stroud, raise your hand right then. We aren't going to wait for question and answer to you. Um, yes? Can it be both? Can it be both? <laughs> uh, certainly. That's allowed. Uh, that's not an that's an or. Um, first of all, the point that I'm going to discuss, this is just simply the outline, is uh, the crucifixion practices match the Stroud in a way that a, 14th century artists could have no possible imagination. I'm going to make argue at that point. Um, the shroud itself has 100 plus precise double marks, like a Roman flagrant, but was only rediscovered in 1709. A forger would have no, not only have no idea of these uh, marks were related to a Roman uh, uh, punishment, uh, but actually would have to precisely match all these double marks uh, to fake it. The test for the blood. Well, let's assume that it was done by a real uh, uh, person. Well, uh, even, if, even if it's done, it done by an artist, you could put the uh, blood on it. So, in fact, we test positive for blood. You can still say it's a fake. It could pass that criteria as well. It's still a fake because you can put the blood on it. However, the skeptics say, well, no, not only is it uh, may or may not be blood, but yeah, it's too red. It's too red. It's not because old blood turns black. Remember that? that uh, it doesn't stay blood. Well, we're going to point out this Bill of Roman uh, from a man uh, with, uh, that, has, uh, that has a lot of dead blood, red blood, red blood cells will turn, uh, keep redder than the um, normal blood. Finally, uh, the, the blood splotch that's on the duct, the uh, sprout itself will match the Roman land. See it in a way that the forger would have no idea that there wouldn't be such a uh, match of the exact size. And uh, related to it also is the rigor mortis. Yes, actually, I came up with the most astonishing book just this week of a someone that's a shroud proponent says this is really Jesus and he's really alive. I mean, that's that that you know I just went I just went almost over, over cliff. I just couldn't believe it. Uh, but this pathologist identified clear evidence as a rigor mortis of uh, the neck, the neck the pathologists, and these are non-religious pathologists. They're identifying their trained pathologists been in the mortuary. The fact the shroud is able to be identified. Things like this are just absolutely incredible. Um, this is the only image I'm going to show you about the shroud, just to give you uh, an idea of it. Um, the, when you see the pictures, you'll see more of the representation. Uh, the image appears to be a slight aging of the plot, perhaps of some type of sport. So we'll identify this as a possibility that's the formation, natural or, or by the, uh, or an artist. Um, the, um, by artist means, some of the proposals with the vast relief of the Hawk statue, and things like that we'll discuss. The original is on the left. You can hardly tell there's an image there. If you picked up that clock, you would hardly tell there's an image. Um, it's, uh, when you, look, you have to go back six feet to see an image. 
Um, and you show the full body image. That the images are uh, the images are almost impossible to form. Artists that have looked at this, you would have to stand back six feet just to see where you put the next part of the paint if you're going to paint it. It would be impossible to paint up close. A high contrast negative on the right is the only way you can see it. In 1898, when the negative properties were discovered, they were most amazed that anybody artist would ever even conceive of painting in the negative. Um, but anyway, we'll discuss that and we'll show that again. Um, first point related to that uh, crucified man of medieval faith is, first of all, the image is not a heat scorch. Why do we know that? Um, the image, uh, heat scorches will, on a fabric, will tend to fluoresce in ultraviolet. In 1978, it was the first time that somebody had actually done this on the shroud with high-tech equipment. Uh, the image form also formed of the topmost fibers. Can you imagine being an artist and painting on just the topmost fibers? Every one of those threads has got 100 fibers on it. And, and yet, with an artist, you have to paint only the top fibers. Well, that would be a pretty hard thing to do, but if you wanted to do it, you could try to do it once. But not only that, if each one of those fibers is pointed to exactly the same darkness. It looks a little different here because there would be a little bit, this particular slide has a little bit of blood on it. Um, but that's the iron oxide um, would be playing on this type of, uh, type of characteristic. Uh, but we'll form, we'll do some high-tech equipment to show that this really you know, what you'll find in the image uh, blood is really is blood. Um, next thing is that in 1978 they discovered something very strange with high tech equipment uh, developed in the space program that the image is completely directionless. Well, if you're an artist, you have, you have a hand. You have to you put it on with a hand. You have to make, you are carefully making all your different uh, motions all in a different direction. The art image is formed in the shroud with a computer analysis based adjustment. Perfect fire. Everything disappears into an absolutely perfectly non-correlated fire. That's very hard to do. It's sort of like being a mathematician. And I can tell you, if you wanted to make a perfect set of random numbers, you couldn't do it. I, I, I can show you a mathematical algorithm, write down a sequence of numbers, and I can tell you within 100 numbers that you did not make a random, random number. So it's very difficult to make it directionless, just as like this. You can't even make a hundred string of 100 numbers that I can't tell you that isn't, that isn't perfectly random. Because, for example, in 100 numbers, you can't remember to put two zeros together, or put two ones together, or a thousand numbers the same way. You can't remember to put all these different marks of uncorrelated numbers. Well, that's not going to progress too far. There's no paint found anywhere on the shroud. What Malcolm McCrone claimed is it was done with paint. You can't adhere something unless you have a binder to create it to the shroud. Uh, next thing that Malcolm McCrone claimed is iron oxide in the shroud. Granted, it was iron oxide in the shroud, but the iron oxide is not connected to the image and he wouldn't respond to that claim, that, that problem. Um, he says, well, iron oxide formed the image, but that's it. Well, you have, to, you have to show there's a correlation. You can't just put the whole shroud in a number, number game. You have, to, you have to correlate it. But the, the other point related to it is examining specimens independently. Uh, he was given samples to, to examine, but wouldn't go examine um, the, the, in detail. They didn't come to the committee meetings. Wouldn't be crossing. He's called a crossing. In a legal case, you want to be cross-examined, right? You have, you have to defend your, your viewpoint. Um, but he refused to acknowledge any kind of reputation as well. Uh, but we, he didn't have enough time to debunk the, the inland map and uh, make, it, make a big deal about that. And then let's go back in history a little bit to 1898. The image was found to be a photographic negative, like I showed you. This is most surprising um, because no artist in history has ever painted in a photograph in a negative. In fact, until the discovery of photograph, nobody even imagined it, that it was possible to do this. Uh, more so, it has a 3D image properties. In 1978, they used a high-tech device from the Mars program to show that this shroud can actually has distant properties. When you're closer to an object, it's darker, and you're further away, you can do light. All photographic property, when you make a regular photograph, it does not have the property. It's a definitely it's something that has to be done uh, carefully in, in analysis to show. And, it, and that whole feature disappears about four inches away when they tried to do an analysis that this directional properties only works in short distances. You can't have a high, somebody from far away like the camera obscura, is what we'll talk about later, later because that's one of the methods of creating the crowd. Um, next thing, property is light is collimated. Collimated is very nice. Collimated basically means, colli um, is, means the light is, uh, is collimed with. Uh, so it's in one, one direction. In this case, the reason we say it's straight up is because the sides on both sides of the image, of the head, body, are all fuzzy. 
you know what's amazing? Is every other place in the body is so precise, we can see these little marks precisely in the body, measure them, measure the lance size, we can measure, you know, the eyes, we can measure everything related to the body except the edges. An artist, and every major artist will tell you this, all major artists are done with edges. That's how you design, that's how you make the painting. If you don't have an edge, you'd have to stand way back and try to figure out what you're doing. Um, for example, does anybody like impressionist paintings? I'm sure you do. A lot of you do. It's very difficult because you have to you have to stand back by file just to try to find where you're going to put the edge. And what they do very often do is pencil or some way of where you like to put the average edge of the uh, the painting. Uh, the next problem I mentioned before, I think, was uh, is there's uh, no direction to the light source. Uh, that is, when you're doing a photograph, if you always see a photograph, it's always if you have a direction to it, it may be straight out, straight off, but you can tell from the shadows where the direction is coming from. In the case of the trout, there is no direction to light source. It's, uh, there, it, you can analyze that. The, um, and I did mention before, the image discolorations are identically dark. Not only a little bit dark, but identically dark. That is, have anybody seen a, 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 about 30 or 40 years ago, uh, that you're old enough, if you remember, looking close at a newspaper print? This print had little dark splotches for me. When you got closer to it, you can see they're all the same, they're all the same darkness. Well, this is the same thing. The shroud images is darker when close, when objects that are closer together, more darkness is closer together. So uh, any fiber will be darkened, and then one will be yellow next to it. So two darkers together, closer together will make a darker part of the shroud. Very, very difficult to do if you're an artist, almost impossible. Uh, last method of creating artificially is then now this code is called the camera obscura. Um, not knowing that an artist could do this in the 14th century, but certainly it's possible. There's one of the proposals published in literature is that hang a dead body up and or a live body up, and uh, we're going to put it through a, a pinhole and we're going to break a cloth and we're going to put some dust in it some stuff. And they were able to successfully do this. But the problem is when you successfully do this, is you have to put leave the dead body out there for a day or so, let him rot, and uh, it doesn't work too well. And uh, but they, they, they don't bother me. They only put the part that they want to show that it's possible to do it. Yes, it's possible to form an image, but it isn't precise. It's a fairly uh, better with camera obscura than others, but uh, as far as making a photograph, but it fails the property of a collimated uh, light source um, and 3D image properties. So it, it, none of these methodologies maintain all the properties. Is this an image uh, fading with age? No, it's just the opposite. The image is absolutely not faded with age over the period that's been known. Only the background gets darker. That's the reason that you can't see the trout as well, well. And that's why I showed you the first photograph, is that they artificially uh, changed to make the contrast faded, lighter and darker. And all of a sudden, you can see the contrast better. It can make uh, it able to see the image better. But it's going to have a period of time that the image will disappear uh, and then because the background will get darker. It, we discovered, most amazingly, that the shroud Apparently, did not change within the fire. 1997 was not destroyed. Uh, not, they were rescued from that fire, but in the back in 1500s, uh, uh, that uh, there was a shroud that actually burned holes in the shroud, but it didn't affect the image whatsoever anywhere else. If it had been an artist image, that fire would have run run the paint. It would have done something to change the image. Um, but what the new discovery, something you'll never have heard before because it's been fairly new, is uh, the, there was a faint duplicate image on the reverse of the shroud. One of the most strangest things is why should there be an image on only the top of those fibers and a very faint reverse image, uh, the same image on the back. So the back one, I haven't read it, it didn't say it, but I will predict the one on the front image was a negative, but on the back side will be the, the identical image, so it will actually be a positive. So um, yeah, just because it would come through. But I don't think it that means the formation, but there is somebody that proposed a method for, for that. Um, but it's certainly very amazing uh, how we're going to explain that. Um, and I talked before, the body image has no border. Uh, none body image face closer than six feet, I already mentioned that. Another one that I didn't mention is it discovered in 1978, the image disappears from the back there. Um, well, when you have a painting and you have something on it, you know, you put it back to it, you should be able to see it, right? But no, it totally disappears. It only when it's it hit from the front because it's only on the back of the front. Front pirates will like to the other direction doesn't see those uh, that that uh, discoloration. So it's uh, definitely expected. The only thing that comes up in back to it is the uh, blood stain image. We call it I just call it a splotch. 
to be fair about it because we don't know its blood until you test it. So let's test the blood uh, in the first place. Uh, next thing was the dumbbell marks. There's over 120, so 120 pairs of these little uh, marks that are like dumbbells. And in 19, uh, fairly recently, uh, in 1709, not that recently, it was excavated, uh, the Herculean, uh, Herculaneum uh, was, uh, they found, uh, it wasn't preserved like this, it's actually been reconstructed, but it's found these dumbbell marks. Nobody had any idea how the, the Roman flagrant looked until that period of time, but an artist not only has to know this, but you'd have to recreate every one of these perfectly, you know, and uh, the detail, make them the right size uh, for this uh, recreation. What about the lance? The lance is, uh, is formed on the right side. That's where your heart is, uh, most people. Um, it would match. Um, and the, the image size is 4.4 by 1.1 centimeters, which is 1.7 inches with 0.67 inches. Uh, when I say perfectly matches a Roman lancea, nothing matches personally any of them. One, you know, lanceas don't match each other, but it would be an expected size. But this certainly would be unknown to a 15th century artist. Uh, this is probably the weakest part of my argument, even though I have a coin that's based on it, but it's certainly most pretty because I like coins. Uh, but they've been argued that the um, point on the object on the eye are, in fact, points on the eye. Uh, I think that there's evidence of that, but when close examination, people have a hard time seeing it. So it could be the image of uh, your imagination, you can say. Like seeing clouds, you see a dinosaur on the clouds. You can say, well, maybe that's not really there. but. But there's a technique in, in computers called computer enhancement, like we did with the Shroud image overall. And computer enhancement does find these objects, and not only does it find it, it finds the letters on the objects which match the coin. The coin in the bottom, this Pontius Pilate coin, married, uh, minted in about 30 AD, does match in many points and points of similarity, uh, even to the points of the letters meaning the uh, Tiberius Kaiser, the first letters. The last three of the first part, and the first three of the second part, they identify the letters. In fact, the most interesting thing about it is the fact that letters that are found K-A-I are misspelled because the, uh, if you can see that, that K-A-I on the crowd, that's actually a misspelling of the C-A-I, the Roman spelling. The K-A-I would be the Greek spelling, right? And so people have argued when they first discovered this, well, you must be wrong because it's misspelled. Well, somebody went and looked and they looked and they found the real points that have that same misspelling. So again, I'm saying, as, 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 as interesting as this is, it's probably the weakest argument simply because many people saying, well, you can say that, well, you're just, you're just, you know, creating that out of nowhere. Uh, most important thing about, about, about pathology is identifying rigor mortis. This is debated. If it's a real person, can you identify it's a real body? Again, I've said a whole book, a person that just said, Jesus wasn't even dead on the cross. Uh, but rigor mortis was very interesting because the uh, man that's identified in the shroud is because uh, his hands crossed over his body, uh, his privates. In particular, one of the criticisms I read in the Skeptic magazine says, well, this must be a forgery because uh, it's obviously showing a, a modesty, crudity. And I said, no, I'm thinking that because the you know, modesty of crudity in the 14th century was put a linen garment over there, not your hands over it. It's completely new. So except for that uh, characteristic. Uh, but the rigor mortis aspect was the neck is obviously based on the body. Uh, the most interesting thing about it, which doesn't come up most things, is the foot is actually bent very sharply down on the image, indicating that it's stuck there. I mean, a body that's not normal will, will restore itself you know, uh, to, a, to a normal state. But in fact, the image shows that the uh, foot is actually stuck in a, in a downward position, as if it, like it would have been with a hole in front of it. Uh, as it's been nailed to a cross. So it definitely shows a rigor mortis characteristics. Uh, some people have seen, more polished have seen, that even the, the back of the body, the buttocks, the like, body shows evidence of rigor mortis. They, they can identify photographs. So to them, that it's like a photograph. But the problem is, is that how are you going to make this as a, as a natural mechanism? So let's propose that. So we're skeptic. We're saying, yes, it's a real body. Let's uh, try to recreate a photograph we based in a body, okay? They're saying, well, it could be an aura or an early photograph. I've already shown you the camera obscura has that problem because you'd have to leave a body out there for a whole day or two decomposing uh, would make a real problem with that. Uh, aura, we have discussed that, it may might be possible. But again, you have to have, with all these characteristics, you have to have a real crucified body to do it. So let's propose that as the 
uh, fall back mechanism, a real brick gets a possibility, a real crucified body by a nationalistic mechanism. We'll get back to that in the last uh, question. Uh, but I've looked at all the methods for skeptic, skeptics, I'm not going to present them all today, but it's, it's very difficult to uh, even imagine how you're going to create this naturalistically. And, the, and, and yet when I read the articles, they even make like, well, vast relief, that's no problem, you know, or photograph in the camera obscura. So they make these as if there's no problem. Well, I'm trying to show both sides, well, that, that, and I want to show you that we have considered that, and it's very uh, problematical to even imagine how it could be created, even if you have a real crucified body. Um, Joe Mickle's idea of vast relief, well, statues, well, there's no detail on statue whatsoever. I mean, it's that too preposterous. You know, you're going to put this in an artist, maybe, but, but, but it's, that's really it's very fuzzy. It doesn't have a good characteristic of detail. Um, most important part here is also human blood. Very important issue. Is it real human blood? Well, you can argue about a, 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 a artist, they could add the human blood, just splotch here and there. Well, yeah, but it's got a problem. Is the one problem I mentioned before is red. Two is too red. Um, the indication, though, for the analysis of Pathologists like Pierre Bynum Bolivik in 1981 using human, human test, chemistry deterring blood type AB. Again, the, the type I, I won't uh, you know, think it's you know, definite. Again, it's just confirming the blood is very likely. Uh, the redness is actually due to the bill of root, which I'll show you in the last point. Um, that's stress of the liver. If you have uh, jaundice, for example, that you turn yellow, remember that, that characteristic? The reason is because your body is producing too much bilirubin uh, because all that uh, red blood cells are getting killed off and your body is trying to react from it when your liver by creating too much bilirubin. Um, bilirubin itself is only yellow-orange, but your body will have this yellowish property. and also will tend to turn uh, blood for many, many centuries, will keep it a reddish flavor, reddish side rather than turning black. Um, next methodology of an analysis of blood is called hemoglobin test by spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is a way of analyzing the frequency of light. So you take the image of light coming back, you do it in plants, right? You get the red shifts and things like the plants. You identify what frequencies are coming back by running through a computer engineering device that will actually get the frequencies of the light that's coming back. Well, it's called, and you're doing interplanetary stellar analysis, you're saying, oh, that's that light coming back from the star has got iron in it, that's got calcium in it, that's got like helium that's discovered on the, on the sun that we didn't know what it was. But in the case of hemoglobin, there's a test of four different bands, three major bands, and the most important one here is uh, 410 nanometers, that's the violent absorption band, uh, as discovered for hemoglobin. So uh, there's, there's compelling evidence for uh, hemoglobin, based on spectroscopy. Spectroscopy. Um, what's the next test? This is 1978, uh, human uh, blood test by X-ray fluorescent test. They identify uh, the maximum is was from calcium, astronomy, tronium, but it was evenly on the shroud. Um, so the iron was maximum in the splotches, which would be expected with a good flood. Um, the UV photograph also shows something unusual. It shows that the splotches uh, had a uh, characteristic uh, that's different. The splotches have a non-fluorescent UV in the splotches of the blood and has a halo that is fluorescent halo, something around those trout. When they looked at that and analyzed it, that's serum, it's called porphyrin. That's the analysis, that's the Alan Adler. And by the way, Alan Adler is agnostic too. You can't be accused of being a, 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 a fundamentalist uh, trying to prove this. Uh, but the high UV fluorescent characteristic, what is porphyrin? It has a high UV extinction portion. What is coefficient of extinction? It means over a period of time, everything degrades. And uh, it means that uh, porphyrin will, this, this halo will last for thousands of years. Uh, other things don't, like we'll see it in vanillin. We'll do the vanillin uh, method pretty sort of short. But the lesions itself do not give you fluorescent, only the halo also. So not only the lance moon, no halo, no fluorescent, but halo fluorescent around it, but also the lesions of the dumbbell marks. Remember the dumbbell marks that also have the same characteristic. Human blood is identified by many tests. I give you more details so you know I have some data. The iron uh, level is 0.02 to 0.04 milligrams, varies in the splotches, only 0.01 milligram to, uh, uh, per, per centimeter squared on the face and elsewhere. And there is, Paul McRone was wrong. So iron oxide is not associated with the image whatsoever. Uh, the iron oxide paints do not make that image. The skeptics claim that blood is too red. I've already identified, I've already talked about that, the little yellows. That's created by the 
Ah, uh, red one cell image. You have a question? Of course. Okay, so the image was on the outside of the fiber on the very right. back. Right, yes. But the blood was it kind of distributed normally as if it had splattered? I'm trying to mistake. No, the, the, uh, he's asking is the blood spattered? The only spattering of blood is from apparent wounds. There's some drips on the blood, which I haven't forgotten in detail, which we can do some other kind of. So that was blood. just on the, uh, on the cloth, uh, but the image itself was totally different from being just on the very top. Right, but, but, he, but he's saying, even including the fact that we have drips, we have holes in the hand, we have holes in the wrist, that is. Um, those are, um, that, that adds to iron oxide. Right? But, but we suspect there's another explanation, too, is that, that the uh, artists of the centuries, the last five centuries, whenever they make a copy of the shroud, they put their paint. We know that, we've got records of that. They take their paint and they touch it to the shroud. You're going to have paint and iron oxide sitting in your shroud from, that, uh, from the, the blessing they're trying to provide uh, to their paint. Um, so let's move on. <coughs> Question number two, if it's not a medieval faith, uh, then can we dedicate it to the first century? Um, what about the carbon dating? Is it reliable? Other dating, all these other datings, everything else, dates including the vanilla date and whatever, dates from the sixth century. I think one of the most strongest arguments was the art analysis. Well, yeah, but you can say that the artist copied the shroud, you know, uh, the, the, the major crowd copied the painting, so that's not a compelling argument, but it's still a good one. Um, coins in the art, both eyes match 80 and 30. We talked about that, still possible, uh, not a strong argument. Uh, but the most uh, common uh, criticism is that uh, all these three of one textile, textiles, they're not common at all, they're just simply, you know, we, we found some shrouds in, in uh, Jerusalem, they're not three in one tail belt. Um, yeah, but they're common in Egypt, Ramses, and, you know, prior to 1000 BC, so you can't say it's not Mideast. It's certainly Mideast to have three in one uh, textiles. Mostly silk, but some, uh, some flax. Uh, the most uh, strongest, the uh, weak, strongest, very uh, hard to fake argument is the whisk of the carton. Whisk of the carton upon the loom, from the loom. In other words, the looms that made the shroud out of flax, which is different than cotton, had little tiny bits, microscopic bits of uh, cotton in them. Uh, but there's no cotton in Europe, uh, even in the 15th century, so it, a shroud maker probably would have had to go buy one from Israel, from the Mideast, in order to make the shroud in, in France. So it's not a good argument. Um, the shroud image supposed to match the image of Jesus after the 6th century. Well, I'm going to talk about the, the death image later, I'm going to go to another part of the talk. But, but, but we, the claim that knowledge is from history is that the Edessa image was rediscovered in the wall of Edessa about 80 to 550. And when I say we know from history, we just know from copies of these things and, and writings about them. That's what I mean by history. Um, I'm not saying at this point that we know that's a fact. All we know is the art matches uh, the, the, each other. In the 6th century, all of a sudden, the art of Jesus changes completely. Before the 6th century, they're all clean-shaven here. Afterwards, they all have beards. So very specific times and uh, something like 14 different characteristics, which we'll see. Let's look at some pictures here. Um, the uh, mosaic from the Arch Episcopal Chapel in Ravenna, Italy. So just the, the early part of the sixth century shows twice a warrior, and the one on the left is using a different image, another mosaic. Um, both clean shaven. In fact, uh, almost all of the images are, uh, are clean shaven. They're all different. You notice that each one, two ones are different. They're not, no, there's almost no similarity between them if you do an analysis. Uh, it's a really nice work of art. I'll hope to get there someday. Uh, uh, is anybody into uh, Hagia Sophia, beside ourselves, Constantinople? Uh, gorgeous work of art. It was covered over by centuries by the Muslims and uh, instantly restored to its uh, beautiful uh, original. But its uh, characteristic, if you look for it, you'll see all these different characteristics in the 6th century, late 6th century. You notice the mustache comes down, the gap under the uh, mouth, uh, pointed beard, hair part in the middle. Uh, uh, Alan Weiner uh, from uh, Duke University professor points out 250 points of similarity with the shroud face. You can come back to somebody a murder with a paint picture with it less than nine characteristics. So three times the uh, requirements for the conviction in court of law of similarity. Um, does the shroud date to the first century? Let's see. There's quite a bit of characteristics here from these uh, six uh, uh, images. What I, I would go through these, but it's a long list and uh, it's kind of hard to do. It may have better than to talk about it, but I. Just the, just the hair wisps, um, hair on one side shorter than the other, 
a U shape, it needs the uh, eyebrows, they call it open and square with a no top, um, a downward pointing via triangle on the nose bridge, uh, one a raised eyebrow, um, accents in both cheeks, uh, forked beard, just slightly forked, not big points, but just slightly gap in the middle, um, a gap in the beard below the lower lip, like I said, for this area of openness, and large left nostril, um, and set line below the nose. Again, these are all the negative. So you have to look at the negative part to get these characteristics, but they're the one making the artist are doing the positive. So when I say the character left and right, you have to realize this is not the negative image. They're painting from the positive, but well, they think it's the positive image. Um, large left nostril and a dark nine. But the picture you know, of the track, you see that one streak above the middle? That streak is also shows in many of the art icons. Um, it says, see some more pictures here, paintings. Price Pack Creator. And uh, I'm creator means the Lord Almighty. I actually found it today. It's something interesting. My Bible study uh, from 2 Corinthians 6.18 is it's the I creator and the Greek use of the word Lord Almighty. Uh, again, the Lord Kyrios, I creator, is the uh, Lord Almighty used in that context. It's used it several times in the Old Testament, which I can give you references for. But a beautiful piece of art from uh, uh, Cephalu Cathedral in Sicily, in 1131. Uh, at least three centuries before the trial. Another beautiful picture, Christ Con Creator from 1100 uh, uh, BC at Daphne near Athens. Now look here, a uh, double hairlock. Look at the top of the hair, just below the hairline. Um, hair center parts, uh, right hair a little bit further. Um, uh, a V feature above the nose, large eyes, again, circular type, circular type eyes. Uh, long nose, uh, fork beard, a little bit of gap here between the two five that, and a beard gap under the lip, where it's where it's the skin. So a beautiful painting, but has the same characteristics in many cases of the trout. The coin recently found uh, from Justinian II, uh, 685. Uh, he, remember, these are, these are Byzantine uh, characteristics. So Byzantine became Christian around this period of time. Uh, they put uh, Jesus on the coins. The trout image is very well represented. Inverted V in the hairlock, uh, long mustache, look, kind of coming down, it's kind of hard to see the point. I'll bring a point at least, but I can afford one. <laughs> uh, full short beard, not very long beard, but uh, no hair on your lip, owlish eyes, like the circular type eyes. Beautiful picture. Um, how about linen? The linen was the three in one herringbone weave. Uh, I can describe that, but it, it, it would take too much time. Uh, shows the style of the East and Middle uh, East, not even known in the 14th century. So they couldn't even have gotten this out, uh, the three in one trip, 12 from, the, from France. So that's kind of a weak argument. Uh, so, but the, the microscopic cotton traces from the loom, cotton was not even known in Europe. So it was, that was uh, very difficult to explain that. Um, I think this is one of the strongest new arguments that's come up, and very recently, um, in the period of uh, 2000. Uh, that the Richard Raymond Rogers, before he died, did some detailed analysis of vanilla. Uh, most people think of vanilla as a vanilla bean, okay? If you have vanilla bean, you take vanilla, you grind it up and put it in your ice cream. Uh, but <laughs> great stuff, but vanilla carries some other things that exist in flax. So flax uh, has vanilla, over a period of time, the vanilla degrades and becomes undetectable. Just remember I said the uh, lifetime of certain compounds like porphyry have progressed. The lifetimes of the compounds are degrade. Um, the, the vanilla found in the shroud is undetectable. That is, it's, and according to Raymond Rogers published in a referee technical journal, says this identifies the shroud as at least um, 1,300 up to 3,000 years old. It cannot be, um, they, they didn't have space in history. Um, certainly, the light image would be about, I mean, but there it's about 30%. I mean, 30% of the vanilla would be present in 1,400, um, from two to present in 600 years. So it's a very strong dating technique for identifying this at least uh, uh, 1,300 years old, but not conclusively uh, first century, but certainly dedicated. Um, how about the carbon-14 Um I would say this affected me most because my wife can tell you I did some lectures on the carbon, on, uh, not carbon-14 dating, but on, on uh, the Shroud of Turin back in 1980s, early 80s, and about 1988, uh, carbon 14 dating came out, like the many other people said, I'm done with it. Not because I didn't believe that we had some heavy use of relics, but you know, why bother? I mean, proven the, uh, the, uh, 
the media will then, uh, you know, it kind of trumps everything else, right? You know, at least I wasn't positive of that, but you certainly didn't waste my time on it. Uh, for 25 years, until this last year, until I find, find out what some of the, start reading one of the material, start, especially back with Gary Habermas to talk on. Again, Gary Habermas is the only academic that actually is a Shroud proponent. There is, won't even discuss it in any other, I can make it, Steve can tell him, won't even discuss it in schools because it's so hot, it's a hot button issue. Um, but we can, we can talk about this more if we want to. Um, but the carbon 14 day is uh, very interesting because it violates every known methodology of carbon 14 day that's done to the state. First of all, it violated the protocol. The protocol was established was to use different regions. If you're going to date an object, one region, that's, that's something from contamination or some uncertainty. You want to use more than one region. Use a mathematical analysis. If you pick three samples from the same region, you're going to get the same dates. I mean, what's going to that? A no-brainer? I mean, you don't do things like that. Um, second thing, the violation of protocol. Use seven labs. Um, you know, you small samples. They don't need very big samples. You just need seven different labs to, to make an mathematical analysis. You, you take seven labs, you take the mean and variation of seven samples, you get a reasonable distribution, right? You take three labs, you can, there's a very high probability that all three come to the same number, just a basic chance. So it's not a good methodology. Of course, the thing is to request specifically not use this race area region, which is suspect. It's got a wrong coloration. It's got a discolored region. Um, they, you know, what, why, why didn't you ignore the evidence? The answer is they divorced themselves from talking to the stir. They specifically told them they didn't want to have anything to do with the stir group because they wanted to be scientific. No, actually, well, so that don't, don't confuse me in fact. So the bottom line is 1980, the shroud was dated to 1360, 1260 to 1390 with 95% confidence. Doesn't that sound like a no-brainer? It's, it's done, you know, right? It's done deal. The answer is, yeah, that's only if you decided that you did it properly. Um, but you know, let's go on from there. Uh, come back to that if you want to. Uh, question number three, to base the first century, is, it there, is there a prominence trail to Jerusalem? Well, here's one of the strongest arguments that I have seen back in 1982, but it's going to come even stronger since then. You'll see that. But the Providence Trail of Max Fry was uh, the trail that he found cat compounds. This is just a survey now. I'm not going to talk about the pollen from found from France, to Turkey, but most from Jerusalem. Did you ever hear about that? No. No. When they're, when they're trying to debunk the trout, their articles will not even mention the parts that hurt their case. So, uh, but where could it have been? Could it have been the image of Edessa? Oh, well, yeah. But you, you got no connection. Don't don't bother me with that fact. Well, but yeah, but it had the image of Jesus, and it was very, and it was all, you know, very phasey, well, not with the of hands. So it's got some characteristics. It's not, I mean, it's only a head in that case that they can think they can write about. But what about the Mendelian and, and, and Constantinople? It had a faint image, um, full body image. Maybe that could be connected too, but it was supposed to be able to be used. Maybe there's a connection there. Um, but I, the new evidence uh, from, uh, actually published in Biblical Archaeology Review, which many of you get. Um, there's a strong, compelling case for being found in Jerusalem by a agnostic Jew named Bennett, a uh, uh, professor of uh, botany at, uh, at the Hebrew University, uh, identifying not only there's, he finds an abundance of flower pollen, specific flower pollen, but he found a flower image. Nobody had discovered this before. There's a flower image. How on earth did a flower image get there? Uh, that have the pollen associated with it there. Uh, and another very compelling one piece of evidence is, uh, uh, again, published in the bar, I guess probably the last one was published in a different journal, but uh, limestone in the heel matches only uh, limestone found in Jerusalem, 1986 bar. We'll get into that um, in more detail. Uh, let's discuss the limestone issue first. The uh, limestone, and not only a little bit, a significant uh, amount of it uh, found in the back of the heel, again, the right place to find uh, something, uh, was uh, a usual form of calcium carbonate. Yeah, calcium carbonate from the from many different methodologies, in case you didn't know it. Uh, but uh, well, the most rare kind is travertine argonite, uh, and even rare with small amounts of tritium and iron. I can show you the charts, but I decided to leave it out. It's published in the art, and I have the journal reference right there. Um, it's a, you can actually find the journal article either online or find it over at, uh, I got it, my copy over at uh, Northwest University has a copy. Um, what it does, it doesn't even match limestone 30 miles away. I mean, this is, this, is, no, this is incredible. I mean, this is very strong in arguments that this shroud was in a limestone tomb in Jerusalem. I, I just think it's just amazing. Um, 
How about the shroud itself, size of the shroud? This is new too, I haven't seen this before until recently. The shroud is uh, size, it's just accidentally, it's just says accidentally. Some, some guy forger from the St. Francis just accidentally picked up a shroud that was eight <coughs> Syrian cubits by two cubits. Well, you could say that's just an accident. He just cut the cloth and got it. But you know, it's him. So it uh, looks like it was created in that form. Um, but the shroud is uh, 175 inches by 43 inches. And you know, there are other cubits. It's just, you, you know, there's, a, there's not the only cubit out there. You know, your forearm is 18 inches, it could be 21 inches. So a Syrian cubit is 21.7 inches. It just happens to work out exactly eight by two. Well, just a coincidence. Uh, but the conclusion, there is a small argument here that the shroud was made in the Middle East, not in Europe. Um, what about the pollen records? Again, the trail. Um, I'll give you a little more detail on that. Is the pollen records trail in Turkey and Israel, but the plant plant pollen is a unique to species. In fact, this argument is so compelling back in 1978 when Fry came up with it, all this shroud critics could say is that you're a fraud. You, you, you just made this stuff up. You must have put it on there. Because one piece of pollen is one thing, but he found 59 different unique pollens that were identified and many of them come just from Israel or and could not find it, possibly found in France or Italy. So uh, there's a trail of the pollen to Turkey and Israel that he had actually go to Israel and, and find these plants. He didn't even know what all the plants were. He had to go to find these specific plants. Dr. Nimbani in the Zurich Police Science Lab and used the pollen for identifying murder victims. Um, he did some kind of bad deal, we'll just found out of it. He used sticky tape when he got these guys. Without any, not, no need to agitate, so he cut some marks on the shroud. So he did something bad there. Um, he did 49 pollen samples there. But uh, again, I said, I'll skip this a little bit. He used, uh, 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 most of the samples, 45 species, 78% were found in Jerusalem, uh, but only a small uh, percentage, 29% were found in Transnational. Again, there's some overlap with some of these characteristics, uh, but not, not that much overlap. But the conclusion based on the state's data is that the linen shroud was likely made near Jerusalem and traveled far beyond France or Italy. So, a forger, you buy a shroud in, in, in Jerusalem, you buy it in Italy. You can. Um, it's still possible. Uh, how, about, how about this data? I think this is really amazing. This is published uh, in a science journal, but it's republished in Science News again in August 3rd, 1999, uh, post uh, carbon 14 days. Um, he's a strong, Jewish scholar. He's not a Christian, not a uh, evangelist in any sense, but he is committed this this pollen on the shroud. He's just he just uh, he's determined. Not only a little pollen, a lot of pollen. I mean, he's identified a lot, a big splotch of it by this flowering. I just think it's amazing. In fact, Science News is not known to be a, a promoting religious artifacts. Is saying you know this is very good you know good evidence. Is they're, they're they're going in letters to the editor. Nobody refuted him. Uh, he's he's a big man. Uh, um, I don't know, talents and, uh, and capability of botany. Uh, so he knows his stuff. And not only this one one, I gave you an example of the thistle, you know, Delia tur turn of 40, but he had two others that are less compelling. But this particular one was imaged, uh, and the plant is only found from March to May, which is exactly the right time for it to be flowering for an April crucifixion. So it's, uh, this, uh, this is really amazing coming from a Jewish scholar, and he's, uh, he's very, uh, Adamant about that. How about the uh, other, just as a side, what about the crown of thorns? I think it's interesting about this painting of El Greco for 15 days, a beautiful painting, but nobody seems to notice the fact that the, the crown of thorns that he's wearing, uh, uh, Christ is wearing on this, is a, is a uh, wreath. Uh, because Europeans and all the European artists all call crowns as far as wreaths. You notice the, uh, all the artwork at the time, all crowns are all wreaths. Well, the Mideast crowns are all mitres, or all caps. If you don't see the Eastern Orthodox, all the other crowns that they wear in the Eastern Church are all caps, mitres. Uh, but the shroud shows a cap, uh, a complete covering all spike marks all over the skull, uh, front and back, uh, which is highly unexpected. An artist forger would have no idea whatsoever, because of all the art of the period from all the way through history has always been a wreath. But the most interesting that one of the pollen of the crowd was the Syrian Christothorn, called a Polarius uh, Spina Christa, again, um, just an uh, incident fact. Uh, what about the Providence Trail of Jerusalem? We're going to do reverse chronology. Uh, uh, reverse chronology is turn Italy. Uh, I did it the other way around in 
few will get confused, so I'm going to go from the latest backwards in history. Uh, during Italy, uh, the fire of 1997 was undamaged. Uh, previously, the House of Savoy, who, who, who gave it to the, uh, the Holy See, the Pope, that is in the 1990s, uh, and uh, previously that in Chambre Cathedral, France, uh, fire from 1532 was very important because that's when all the, the, the silver melted and went in the splotches of the, of, of the corners of the cloth, didn't affect the image much, but it was patched. Uh, some many people argued, well, did they uh, sample the patch area? And the answer is no, probably not. not. That's not a good argument for refuting the carbon 14 day. I won't, maybe we'll discuss that more later, maybe in another lecture, but uh, it wasn't the patch because they definitely didn't sample the silver patch that the silver burned through um, from 1532. Uh, I think it was it probably a, could have been a different patch. Uh, uh, previously, it was a leader uh, France, uh, the church, but here's the most preposterous thing that's an analyst. If you're going to be a identifying a, uh, a false relic worth millions of dollars in their time, tens of millions of dollars according to other relics that were sold for immense choices of money, like the crown of thorns. These are sold for immense amount of things. It was discovered by a, uh, a widow of modest means in her basement from her dead husband who died in the war. Isn't that, doesn't that have a ring of fraud to you? You know, somebody just messes up. But she didn't create it. She wouldn't have the money to make it, for one. Uh, she didn't have no motive. Uh, she just discovered it in her, in her, in her uh, basement. Her dad, her husband had told her about it. Geoffrey de Charny. Uh, very strange story. Where did it come from? Uh, Geoffrey de Charny, the nurse, known owner, was killed in battle in 1350, fighting for the king. Uh, he was exhibited in Lee France by his poor widow, Margaret, 1350. Well, of course, Bishop Darcy, if I were him, I would, I'm right on his page, sure. You know, this is a fraud. I mean, she's a poor widow. She couldn't possibly have something that important. And she didn't know where she got it from either, so obviously it was, uh, it was just a hoax. Um, but he never saw it, gave it a fraud, said he knew the artist. He answered, but did he make that up? Did he lie about it? I don't know. I, I suspect that it was just like me. I would have done the same thing. It's impossible. I've got, you know, we'll just, well, this is my way of putting stuff to it. Some parts will say that the Pope uh, made him, made him uh, uh, agree to them. The answer is not true. The, uh, uh, the, the anti Pope of that period of time, Clement, said that no, that uh, he, he should let the artist, let the artist uh, let her continue to show it as a representation. So that's what she did. She showed it not as a genuine shroud, but as a representation, which is the way it's shown today. It's not, it's not shown as a, a genuine relic like many relics are shown, but it's shown as the church. And I think that's the proper way. I'm actually um, kind of glad about the carbon 14 day uh, showing the other day because it keeps us from keeping it too much faith in it. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, we're going back to history. Where we could have been history and previously the Knights of Templar, they had strange uh, stories about an uh, image of a worship. Um, uh, and so they had a characteristics of the Christ uh, that they, they, they described it from 1204. Again, those are just stories. Uh, Templeton, England has a, has a big painting. It looks big like the um, shroud. It's possible. Um, but, uh, and it's all subjective. It only has to go back to 1204 to really find something that's we can definitively associate with something uh, that looks like a trap. Something where you have concrete data, history, pictures, art. By pictures, I mean, now I'm going back to somebody that has seen the Mendelian and says, I've seen it, and here's what it looks like. So that's what I'm going to discuss now briefly. It's a full body image, sometimes discussed. Most of the times discussed is the lattice grill. It's a, it's a head with a, with a, 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 a center, and don't you nothing more than that, and then a wide frame with a grill on it. I was going to show you my mathematical analysis, but the proportions of the head to the width is actually the same as the shroud, but I'm going to skip on that today rather than going through that. It's called a mandillion. It means it's a piece of cloth with nymphs. That's what the word means. That's all it means. But it's also known as a tetradiplum. What we suspect is the shroud is formed by folding it in four times. In fact, uh, the shroud uh, analysis has shown that this, they can see the full marks. The full marks have been identified as it had been folded in four. That is, folded once and folded again. But the, you think two, that's really one fourth the size. In many times in history, uh, that the Mendelian has been called a cloth not made with hands. Moving right along, this is one of the most interesting pictures, and I don't have the shroud picture to go with it. I didn't find it uh, this period of time. I, I have pictures, but I didn't make it. But the shroud has holes on it. We call it the poker holes because they make a little element. And uh, if you look at the picture there, um, uh, 
Uh, again, I don't have my uh, thing here, but you have to look at the image to see these holes. There's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole, there's a hole. There's a, this is a circle in here, but this L formation, and this is a blow up, this part of the pavilion, found in the Freddy Codex. This is fairly new uh, information. Found in 1195, 1195. It matches the trout's L pattern holes. Um, nobody knew ever knew until they found this manuscript that this, these holes could have been formed prior to the 14th century. No, we no record until, because all the other pictures don't have anything identified on it except the uh, sometimes the last work. But this is the first one actually shows a herringbone type weed and it shows the holes in the exact formation of the trout. Um, you look for the Hungarian, on uh, the website, just look at the Hungarian codex and uh, you'll get the, all the details of that. Um, what about going back before that? The Trail of uh, Providence is now a totally different object it's called the Image of the Desert. Um, but yet there's a, there's a Providence Trail from Medellin back to Edessa because the story does record was taken from, uh, from Edessa to Oasis in Urfa in Turkey, southern Turkey, in the, uh, about uh, 944. So you can trace it back to 944 from, from uh, global four. Um, the last bullet down at the bottom, again, I'm just repeating that same thing I said in the previous slide when we taking it, is uh, Constantinople. But uh, the story going back, and we have the story back going back to, uh, to the uh, 5th century and one later up to the 10th century, that the shroud was brought to Odessa by the, the apostle Jude, Athadius, usually called the Thaddeus, um, but uh, there's some indication in history that Thaddeus was related to Mary as a cousin uh, that was in the family that uh, when, um, when Mary died, she passed this shroud on to somebody else. Uh, my suspect is that, again, I've talked about it before, there was probably possibly no image at all. It was just simply a law, because they were discussed at that image uh, until later, uh, until this period of time. So, but, but the legend of the healing of Christian just in King Abgar, he was sick, um, due to the according story, Thaddeus came to him in the first century, and he know it's a real king, and uh, he uh, was healed, and he, the whole city became Christian. Uh, uh, so he became pagan later on, and uh, one of his ancestors uh, became a Christian again, and uh, 550 was rediscovered in the temple gate. So all that is about, again, these are legend histories. We can't say it's real history, but we know that that's the exception. Uh, the, the uh, here's the, an interesting diagram. Which you can see the, uh, the history of it here. Um, you can see the picture, if you look at it carefully. Uh, the cloth being presented, the Asgard of Thaddeus. Uh, it's a 10th century uh, 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 legend, the story, the picture. Again, it's been created by hand to mouth hand uh, stories, so we don't know where it comes from before that, but there's other stories that are related to it. But we have fairly, you can come in some other references, King Abgar's fifth, uh, but that's the rule of city state between 13 and 50. So it's the right time period and uh, the story to match the story of the shroud in Odessa. Could the shroud of Jesus be brought to the king apostle? Uh, it's, by king Edgar. it's one of the most amazing discoveries. I always thought this was anti-biblical. You don't bring ob have objects to heal people. Only, only Christians heal people believing in, in, uh, in prayer. But here's an example from Acts. I had no idea until somebody pointed this out. Acts 19, verse 11 and 12. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Wow. I, this makes the story of Odessa plausible, not totally uh, um, biblical like I first thought. So um, it uh, has some plausibility even scripturally. Question four. If they originated in the first century, is it the image of Jesus and Nazareth? Does this correspond to the biblical record? Jesus died by a burial wrapped in a slab, left him and decomposed in a uh, slab, not involved as a mummy. That's going to be my contention. Again, this is a debated point. Uh, very bitterly debated, in fact, among the academic community. Um, second point would be Jesus' burials, so will be hand crossed from the groin and Kuma. Um, you know, people, skeptics, I just saw it just recently. That, you know, that's prudish, you know, it must be artist creation to, to cross the Holy Right. Only found in Jerusalem. All the other, uh, and, and Hebrew uh, uh, burial sites, nobody ever finds this crossing of the groin. So this is one example that's, that's hard to fake. Uh, nails in the shroud of wrist, not the palm, that's real Roman crucifixion by 
anatomical test. Um, the anatomical tests indicate that uh, if you put it through the palm, it will rip right through it. And uh, like the, the test by Bardet, if you look at the leg of anybody who studied it, is that it wouldn't hold the body up. Um, that's not necessarily a compelling argument, but maybe the type is, in some cases, the type of it. So, um, but in fact, the Australian image does show an image through the wrist, and you can look for hard and wide, and you will not find a single artist rendition of the of, of, of the of anything other than the, uh, the image of the blood coming through the wrist of the palms. And in fact, the stigmata of the ancient uh, uh, saints when they had these marks were always through the palm. Uh, so it definitely doesn't match to the artist's rendition. It would be considered it a false based on that characteristic alone. Um, the Jewish burial was about to slab it up to the deacon bow. We're, we're, we're almost certain of that. The question was, it, was it mummy? Well, the mummy is a totally different question, but the intention was to decompose. They were decomposed, and after a year, they would put it in a bone box. Well, the question was, uh, is it bone wrapped like a mummy? Um, artists and people still think so. Uh, John 11, 44, and he who had died, Lazarus, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped to the cloth. Doesn't that sound like a mummy? Right. And can can deny it. Raising of Lazarus at the Duke of the Luna Segna, Italy, fall 78. Um, but look at, take a look at that picture. Does that look like a guy who's going to go anywhere? I mean, he's not going to go anywhere. No, I don't, I don't think he's going to walk anywhere. Not anytime soon. But you can show you how ingrained something can be. Even biblically, among biblical scholars, they can't see their face from the, you know, from the facts that are related to it. It doesn't make any sense. Um, here's a tomb that we've actually saw. Jenny and I actually visited that site. It's uh, not in Jerusalem. It's off to the side. It's called a... Uh, a uh, Rolling the tomb, uh, rolling uh, stone tomb, and it's really fascinating because these are reused tombs. They open and close it. The fact that uh, the one that Josephus had was unused is very unusual. Most of these tombs are all used and reused. Look at all these bone bones. They're called ossuaries. Ossuary is a Greek word for great bones. It's like uh, after the bones he can pose, they can put another body in there, wait another year, and only put another body in there. So, uh, it's definitely. In fact, that was one of the big contentions about recently in the involved academic literature about uh, who the bone boxes are, like one pound per time, just for example. So um, that's interesting. Jurius' uh, burial practice. What about the actual record in the Bible? Jesus' burial was not, uh, in John, Luke and Mark, um, Jurius' burial was not completed before the Sabbath. They buried her body, but it's not completed. We know because the women were coming back. How many women? Five women. I'll go through that if you do some other day. Um, but the women were coming back, returning Sunday morning, expecting to leave the knowing of what Jesus' is body, his wife is watching. So the big contention here, and I have a book on this that just came out, uh, Frederick C. Diddy. So he contends that Jesus was washed. So we're not even sure from the image that no, it wasn't washed or not. We're not sure of all that. So there's uh, big contentions in that. Uh, but we can discuss that. It's just that it appears to be not washed. Um, so we'll have to go with that for one possibility. Um, so there was a face on the cloth. Uh, what about the uh, Jewish burial practices? The burial practices in the Bible, burial, a lot of blood is, is, to, is to wipe up some of the blood. You're not going to let the blood go all over the ground. So they're, they're wrapping this thing up to transport it to the tomb. So something's happening to get it from the, the cross to the tomb. You have to at least put a, something's happening over the face because that's a, apparently a normal Jewish uh, burial practice. That's not to necessarily going to bury with it, they're just transporting it like that, but it's called sudarium. Uh, so skeptics will say, how can there be an image in the shroud because you've got a sudarium over the on the face? Well, the easiest answer to that, and the brainer just says, well, they took it off the face, you know? So they put it in here by, I don't know, that's a fact, but it's certainly consistent. Um, but it's first laid on this face after the rules in the cross. We're pretty confident of that. They don't want any blood still, in fact, uh, they're more than, uh, more, there's one part of the, uh, the Jewish burial practices that they lose too much blood in a violent burial there to not wash the body. There is a reference to that, we can discuss that in some more detail. I'll give some references there. Mishnah, um, uh, the reference from that, um, simply on the quote of Jewish law. Um, but there's another, uh, there's four cloths, another one um, side that, the one on the, the face cloth, the one on the cloth, the breath around the uh, head to keep uh, the jaw closed. Uh, during the start of rigor mortis, well, in our case, we think it's rigor mortis has already started in this awkward position. You can tell the little differences from the side of the head and the body and the arms, like I said. I think the arms had to be forced in examples of how the arms were forced out of the state. Um, moving right along, 
is uh, very practical. I've got quite a set of it of this. Um, this particular one was uh, the man buried in the strata indicates that he was not washed. Um, again, we discussed that before. And if it's a violent burial, then, then there's some indication of Jewish law that we're not to wash the body. So this is a debated point. We can't, we don't know if the syrup is washed or not. Uh, it appears to be not washed, but in, in a violent burial, there's some indications that we're not to be washed. Um, I think they probably intended to wash it, you know, when they came back for the second time. Um, but certainly, the part of the body, body they, a lot of my body is called a water body, a quarter body. You want to keep that blood with the body so to keep it and together in the tomb. So for some reason, uh, exceptions occur uh, when not washing was a person who was killed by the government and sample the blood and the very with him. So um, um, if this is very Jewish customs, uh, just mentioned, and he would, he could not be washed. I did that's the I don't want to get into that. Um, uh, scripture also explains, I just argued, that the burial was incomplete, they were coming back again. So, and perhaps to wash the things. But that's a debated point. Um, what about the nature of the living cloth, which is very, some to, certainly about the condition of mummy. Um, I can't even argue with that. But all I can say is that they're looking, I did a lot of analysis with the Greek version called, was it wrapped, not wrapped. All I can say is there's one thing that's incorrect, which I didn't put up there. The Greek word indicating strips of cloth is incorrectly translated. It wasn't strips at all. There, it, it's just as cloths in the actual Greek, it, but it's called Udern. Uh, so um, they, they, the Greek word is just cloths, it's not scripts. So I, I can, didn't give you a Greek of that. How about Josh McDowell? Uh, was a man married to one or more strips of cloth? There's specific references, Mark 15, 46, 27, 9. And Josh McDowell says, he's a big prison for ejecting the shroud. The shroud depicts one chin of clay, but John is the plural. Well, I just showed you. There's four bunch of Sudarian over the face, he's coming around the mouth. Sewing around the, uh, the, the uh, jaws, um, hold the hands together, hold the feet together. So there could be at least four fifths based on Jewish burial cloth practices. We don't find those, in, we don't find them easily cloth in the jaws. We can't prove that. All I can say is that's normal Jewish practices. Um, then burying the child is four pieces of linen. Um, and I just discussed that. So. Um, there's a shroud match in Bible on a, a crucifixion that was found in 1968. Uh, uh, by the uh, Dolores, step first. Um, the, uh, the, uh, you can see that um, you can see that goes all the way through. It's kind of dark. You can see by the open nail. It's all the way through there. Um, but uh, how is it here? Some there's different Jewish practices, but certainly uh, the Shabbat image shows that that the feet from the looking at the feet. In fact, the interesting thing about it are you have to match the. The, the point on which the nail was in front and the back image in the back, you have to perfectly match them in order to make the fake proud. So he does show the nail going through the right foot and the left foot and top of it. The nail, the foot on the right foot is wholly parallel, meaning he's actually being uh, with a foot next to here as well, bend it out to keep his foot flat. So it's, it's basically hanging like that across his big, in the case of the trout. This bigger one, we think he might have been, they could nail the nails on both sides of the post. And nail, nail to it either side. That's another method. Sometimes they're just wrapped with with uh, the cloth and just let them suffer for a few days. Um, so a lot of other things related. We're running out of time here. Uh, so the last question was, and just close with this one: How could the image of uh, blood get there? Um, all these different techniques. I don't have a perfect answer to this. In fact, the only question I don't have an answer to. But the, we can rule everything else out. The only Paint ruled out. Um, paint ruled out. Everything ruled out except radiation scorches. And the only damage that's been created, and actually, this was done. We actually had a guy put a small bunch of radiation fluid um, that's used for in a laboratory, and he actually created a radiation image. That's the only one that's been successful by swallowing some uh, a compound that will create radiation. And uh, it wasn't as high focus as the, as the crowd image, but it's the only image that can be made. Um, but how does the image form so diffuse that radiation can form? Um, it's a premature aging of the cloth, not a heat scorch. It doesn't fluoresce under ultraviolet. The remarks are extremely precise. All these things measure all the dumb measure points like the reason points on the eyes. You can, you can see flowers being. Oh, the flowers aren't going to take ultraviolet. Well, where's that coming from? You know, so even in plain, there's some supernatural revelation. That doesn't, that doesn't work. You know, how are you going to make, you got to make, all the flowers have got images on the cloth, too. People have even seen letters in the eye. Pollinated radiation. It's the fact that uh, it's the only one that has that property. 
That's uh, all I can say about that. Uh, what is the only proposal that anybody's made that's made sense? From a, I'm talking about from a, uh, a supernatural, possibly actually a resurrection, but even uh, allowing that possibility, you have to have a mechanism. You can't just say God made it. That's not that's not going to work. Uh, but say, but assuming there's a, a supernatural explanation of a resurrection, just that one premise, uh, John Jackson has predicted, in fact, successfully so, that we image on the back side of this block. I think in science, a useful prediction is very, uh, correct prediction is very useful. Doesn't mean it proves the case, it just means uh, science making a prediction is very important. Uh, but uh, not so much, not, not ruled out, as we discussed earlier. Um, they're still working on that. All, which I can say many of the scholars are not confused. They're not, they're not improving the strategy of anyone. Uh, as, uh, and you've got to perform it with fuzzy edges on the side of the body and uh, only in the top five. All these different characteristics are almost impossible to fake. Uh, John 1933, when they came to Jesus, the side was already dead and did not break his legs. The legs aren't broken in the trail image. Um, and then what I just showed you about that uh, guy they found, where he was crucified by his legs, his legs were both broken. Um, that's just, uh, that you got to make, you got to do that, do it. Again, it's part, a real crucified victim, it doesn't match Jesus, would uh, possibly probably have the legs broken just like that, at least I would do. John 13, 1934, when the light, soldiers pierced the side of the pier, committed in blood and water came out. Uh, it's probably not water transmitted, it was uh, clear fluid, which they can call water, or <coughs> the uh, cardio fluid uh, would indicate uh, hurting out coming out of death. Um, um, so these things were done in 1936. These things were done that scripture should be fulfilled. One of his bones should be broken. No bones were broken in the trap, not even in the wrist. Um, and also we think that uh, it was, uh, that tests have shown there's pla several places to put it through the wrist that don't break the bones. And then uh, John 1934, they should look on it. Uh, the scripture says they should look on it from there. Here's a prophecy from Zechariah, also a prophecy. Um, Again, you can say that's uh, um, not that real relevant, but it's actually did it. It's a land shown on the ground as well. Matches that characteristic. I think one of the closing on this last scripture, uh, now Thomas called the twin and said to them, uh, unclean, I, unless I see in my hands the print of the nails, the print of my finger, the print of the nails, put in my hand into the side, I will not believe. And that's the only time it says that he has nailed, by the way. It doesn't say in the actual crucifixion. It says that in his hands and, and uh, uh, by uh, putting aside, I will not believe that it. Uh, and Jesus came into their midst and said to J. Thomas, I can assure that, uh, uh, reach your finger here and look into my hands, and look at your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me and thou hast believed, blessed are the lady that have not seen and yet have trusted me believe. Uh, I have a nice picture here from Caravaggio, uh, the tributary of St. Thomas. Um, and I pray, Lord, that uh, the people here that see and believe, having not seen, touch them. Thank you.